another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. We got a great show for, the, for you today. We got a lot of news. And we not only give you news, we also give you reviews and clues to what's going on in the superhero genre, especially what's going to be coming up in the next few months and, and years. And we're going to dive into a lot of news that's come out since last you've heard of us. Brian, how are you doing? Good. Uh, you know, even though Loki wasn't highest on my list, I'm pretty stoked that it's coming next week so we can add that back into the equation. But yeah, just can't get over the amount of news items that we're getting day to day and some some really big ones too. Some really big ones being dropped. I know we got we have takes on, on everything, but you in particular, I think, kind of stirred the pot for us this week. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a different format today. Um we're gonna actually read some of these articles right just so that you can get some context as to what we're responding to and what we're reacting to so that way and i'll leave obviously uh links to those uh articles down in the description below first up aaron taylor johnson to play marvels craving the hunt of sony pictures now when i first heard of this first of all let's Let's do what I said that we we're going to do. We're going to read a little bit of piece of the article. Um, so this comes from this comes to us from Variety, Adam by Adam B. Vary. Uh, Sony has found his greatest hunter. Okay, Aaron Taylor Johnson will headline Craven the Hunter, further expanding Sony Pictures' efforts to capitalize on its trove of Marvel Comics characters with connections to Spider-Man. J.C. Chander. Uh, apparently he probably did Triple Frontier. I don't know. Uh, uh, that that was with um, on Netflix, right? Yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, I, I haven't Isaac, seen it. Ben yeah, Affleck, yeah, yeah. Garrett Hedlund. Yeah, it's solid. So he's set to direct from a script by Art Markham and Matt Holloway and Richard Wink. Abby Arad, of course, and Match Tomach are producing. Uh... This is the third comic book ad adaptation of uh, for Taylor Johnson because he did Quicksilver, he did something uh, kick ass, and yeah, yeah, and so he's mostly recently appeared in a supporting role in Christopher Nolan's Tenet. Um, apparently, Sony, after seeing his performance from a movie that they're doing called Bullet Train, is it is it called Bullet Train? Yeah, they were so impressed that they immediately thought Craven the Hunter. I immediately thought Sony didn't know that he was in Age of Ultron already and that he was already in the Marvel Universe. Um, uh, going back to the article, it says, much like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Sony is currently building out its own con conclave of spidey related Marvel features and Taylor Johnson's deal suggests he could wind up in other films outside of the Craven franchise. Along with Spider-Man, the character has also tussled with Venom and he's founding a, he's a founding member of the supervillain group, The Sinister Six, which obviously we know that Sony is building towards. A property Sony tried to get into the theaters once before on the heels of 2004's Miserable. The, the, it was not, Miserable is not in, in the article. I'm, I'm, I'm adding, I'm ad living here. And <laughs> the, the amazing Spider-Man 2. So this uh, Craven is set to release in January 13, 2023. Brian, I like Craven the Hunter. I like his character. I enjoyed his character uh, in the animated series. If I'm not mistaken, Craven has some sort of an accent, correct? He's Russian. So his actual name is Sergei okay. Kravinov. And he... Yeah, I agree with you. Craven the Hunter is actually, I think, generally regarded as one of the more complete and interesting villains ever created in comic books. And in a weird way, you could probably cast him as an anti-hero, almost in the mode of the Punisher, where you'd root for him. And then obviously you would kind of root against him if he's going after Spider-Man, which is his ultimate big game that he wants to take down. So this is a critical, critical role. This is not like hey, we pulled villain number 12 off the shelf. This is the front line, and this is a choice that is going to be presumably something you're going to see on screen for the better part of a decade, I would think. Yeah. 
Um, at first, reading this news, I wasn't too sure of this selection. One, because he's already been in the Marvel Universe. How different is he going to look? How different is he going to sound? Obviously, he's going to look different. Let's put that out there. Quicksilver and Craven the Hunter are two different characters altogether. But in terms of his accent, how is he going to sound? Is that going to mess with people? Like, he, you know, is he going to be recognizable to Marvel fans and his o o o already introduction into the Marvel Universe? Um, obviously, he's a talented actor. I would have perhaps still liked to have seen someone else play a role, but Sony is really, they have the chest out and they're really trying to create this universe around Spider-Man that they can, because obviously they own the rights and doesn't seem like they are willing to let go of the money-making machine that is Spider-Man universe. They prove that they can put out something good with Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Venom, which wasn't like critically acclaimed, but it made a hell of a lot of bank. Yep. Morbius looks good. Uh, now they're setting their sights on Craven the Hunter, which again is a very interesting character. How do you, what are your thoughts on, on this cast? And the future of Sony in the spider in the in this relationship that they have with Marvel. So I don't like the choice, and that's not out of you know disrespect for Aaron Taylor Johnson. I just think we have seen him try to play a tough guy type in a couple of movies, and I don't think he's pulled it off either time. So in Godzilla. He's supposed to be kind of like the bomb expert, kind of the hardened soldier. He's okay. I don't know that he's great. I don't think you necessarily buy him as sort of the, the combat veteran who's done six, seven tours or whatever he's supposed to have done in that. And then in Tenet, he's kind of like the brawn. He kind of is bulked up. He's bearded. He's meant to kind of be like this take no prisoners, no nonsense colonel or general in the, in the in the temporal pincer and again it's almost like he gets he, he kind of gets outplayed off the screen by pattinson and john david washington he's just like not powerful enough against those guys when they're together and that's my concern here is that Cra the way i envision craven is this very sort of grizzled hardened been through everything imaginable in while he's been hunting and back like he is scarred beaten up and so i think of that guy as like incredibly strong brawny deep voice like incredibly masculine like high testosterone and i just don't think aaron taylor johnson gets there no. and, and like I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an alternative physically. Now, I, I know Aaron Taylor Johnson can do an accent because he did the Sokovian accent as Quicksilver, so that is not too far from a Russian accent. So he can do the exactly. voice. But his voice is very high. He's a yeah. he's a tenor. Trade. I don't know if he can... I think of this as a voice that needs to be deep um, to really be powerful. No. Uh, so a guy I actually kind of thought of in this role, if he could do the accent, I don't know if you're familiar with Pablo Schreiber. Yes. He was, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen Den of Thieves, yes, he's six foot six. Um, you know, he, you throw a mustache and a beard on that guy, do some makeup scars. If he could do the accent, I think Call. physically he would look the part. And I, that's my thing. This part has to look and sound right before we even get to the script. And I, I know the the pro argument will be, yeah, but did you ever think Heath Ledger could pull off the Joker? True. And I, I'll acknowledge it. You know, that's definitely fair. I just haven't seen Aaron Taylor Johnson's range go to a place where I can say, yeah, I can make the leap to see this being an awesome character that I want to see six times. So I am very skeptical. So it comes down to believability. Will you believe that he's Craven the Hunter? And good call on Pablo Shriver. I think I had him cast as... Uh, 
because I want to do another casting for the X-Men, but I had him cast as uh, Cyclops. Yeah, he could do that too. He's, you know? I don't think people realize, like, he's a big dude. That's yes, the other thing. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what it comes down to. We, we believe he's Craven the Hunter, and um, let's see. I mean, obviously, we haven't seen Bullet Train, so we didn't see what they saw. But this is Sony. They gave us Spider Man Two. They gave us Spider Man Two, the Amazing Spider Man Two. Sorry, they gave us Amazing Spider Man Two. They gave us a, a Spider Man Three with Tobey Maguire. We don't. This is going to be a hit or miss. If you want to connect this to the Spider Man Three discussion, I think you, you also have to believe this guy in the context of the Sinister Six. And I don't really know where we're headed with the Sinister Six. Uh, the rumors that keep coming out is like almost makes me think like there have to be two Sinister Sixes because one of these seems more like the Senior Six. <laughs> sinister Six, because if we're gonna get Willem Dafoe, wow, Alina, right? Like, wow, and you're gonna put them with Tom Hardy and Aaron Taylor Johnson. That is a weird team. Weird. So yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. there's a missing piece there, but I just feel like if you're making casting decisions, you have, you know, I think when Marvel did the Avengers, don't tell me they weren't thinking ahead to not just can they play the individual part, how are they going to look as part of the collective? And I think with the Sinister Sticks, you have to do the same. And so I'm having a struggle with putting Aaron Taylor Johnson into this mix and being like, if he's opposite Willem Dafoe in a scene as Green Goblin, is that really going to work? Again, it comes down to the believability of, of, of these characters coming together. I mean, for heaven's sake, they they, they they almost did the Sinister Six with Paul Giamatti as a rhino. And he may not be done as rhino? Is that? I hope he is. I mean, rhino was mentioned as possibly appearing. What other rhino do we have other than him? So your worst fears of that rhino may be coming... Yeah, we could let's save Spider-Man three for another day because that's a whole other thing yeah, for yeah, us, yeah. I think. But yeah, there's some real oddball stuff going on right now on that side. So. And your thoughts on um, the relationship between Sony and Marvel? What do you think that's heading? Because I believe uh, um, Tom Holland has one more movie under under the current deal that they have. Uh, yeah. Where do you think that's heading towards? You know, I, again, we can we can flesh it out in a full fledged Spider Man three talk later. But I okay. it, some of the some of the most recent headlines either feel like we're kind of getting beaked a bit deliberately in the way that almost like Marvel used um, the rumor mill around Wandavision to kind of put you off the scent. Because, like I said, if we are headed to a legit Sinister Six with Melina, Defoe, Jamie Foxx, Tom Hardy, Aaron Taylor Johnson, and, and Paul Giamatti. Like, is anyone really excited about that? That's kind of a train wreck. Just, I mean, it's a lot of acting talent, but I don't know that it's a lot of cohesive acting talent. And it feels like that's a lot of visions and a lot of yesteryear ideas mixed with modern stuff. Like, that doesn't... that. You know what that feels like to me? That feels like Sony calling the shots and Kevin Feige kind of saying, okay, you guys do that. You guys do what you want. Before That's what move, it feels like a little bit to me. Before we move on, I just want to say this one thing. And you're absolutely right. This could be a Kevin saying, you know what? You want to do this by yourself? Go ahead. <laughs> but while we're doing this over here, and making bank and everybody's excited and you're doing your own thing separate from what for, separate from us let's see how long that lasts because all you need is a horrible movie we need another spider-man 3 and it's over because already fans have said and i've said that we want spider-man in the mcu and if you want to I mean, I, I get it. Business is business and business is good when, it's, when it comes to Spider-Man. But if it's not part of the MCU, then fans are going to turn on you and let you fail. And then you're going to have to sell. 
or keep on losing money? Let us know in the comment section below what you think of, of Aaron Taylor Johnson's Craven the Hunter cast. Uh, let's move on. Joker 2 reportedly co-writing, Top Top Phillips is reportedly co-writing the, the, the Joker sequel. In an article by Collider, Mr. Marco Vito Oldo, a sequel to 2019's Joker starring Joaquin Phoenix is similarly finally in the works with a script co-written co by director Todd Phillips. The news was published discreetly by Hollywood Reporter in the middle of a list of Hollywood's most powerful lawyers. While the THR's list is filled with mostly with descriptions of the lawyers, their clients, and the important projects they help to handle, a single line could have officially confirmed that the Joker is getting a sequel. In the section dedicated to lawyer Warren Dern, we can read that it that his client, Todd Phillips, struck a deal to co-write the next Joker installment. Collider has of now received no official comment of the news from a, any representatives at Warner Brothers. We had a conversation some time ago, Brian, that we didn't believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we didn't believe this Joker 2 wasn't happening because of what's currently going on with Mortar Media and Dis Discovery, right? And that new people are coming into play and they're going to probably sit down and decide whether or not that they should go, f go forward with this. But on the other hand, we also, I believe, talked about, yo, that joint made a billion dollars. It was made for what? 60 billion? I mean, 60 million bucks? 53 yep. or 54, something like that? Yep. And it made a billion dollars. Even if you do another movie, let's say you spend 70, 80 this time and you make $500 million, you still make mad money. Yep. And Todd is going to get a big chunk. This is where you say, why not? <laughs> do you still this is, this think this is happening? Well, this article has the feel of hangover all over again. In the sense of Todd Phillips did Hangover, you know, they catch lightning in a bottle, mega successful comedy, was never meant to be a franchise, but it made the money it did, and everyone kind of everyone in the cast, Todd Phillips was like, "All right, that's too much to say no to. We'll do two more." And by the way, they weren't good. Yeah, they made money. Yeah, they weren't good, but they made money. Yeah. Now this isn't quite as far along. I'm still not like Joaquin Phoenix, unless he is contractually obligated already to do Joker 2. Don't underestimate that guy looking <laughs> at the script. And if he feels like it's substandard, being like, you can find another Joker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if yeah. they do that, the movie's not going to make a lot of money because he is the life and soul of why it made a billion dollars. So, I think it has the feel of, to your point, it made so much money. They went to Todd and said, what is it going to take? And yeah. Todd probably wrote a number on a cocktail napkin and they said, we'll double it. And he's like, all right, all right. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at. That'd be my yeah. guess. Yeah, I mean. Because he got paid for the Hangover sequels. Paid. Like, nine figure paid. Kind of paid. So, I wonder what it's going to take for him. I mean, because he's obviously got I mean, if he, if you're saying he got paid for the sequels of, of, of The Hangover. I wonder what it's going to take when he does another film and it does gangbusters, right? And he's going to say, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to do it because I don't need the money. It's not, it's not about money. You know, this was meant to be a one shot story and that's it. But money talks every time, it seems. Well, here's the weird thing. Let's say the movie... Let's say the movie is just as successful if not more successful and the new warner executives are like okay we're remaking the dc universe we're you know we're reconstituting the justice league our most successful director is this dude over here doing his own thing 
what's it going to take for you to direct Justice League? That's the question I think will become really interesting if he keeps putting up billion dollar movies for them. Because right now he's sort of operating on the side. He's been the one guy that they've kind of let do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. And yeah. but if he's putting up a billion one, a billion one, like a billion two, like they're gonna go to him and be like, "You got to be the Godfather." <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, does Joker two get made once again? Let us know. Next up, Lee Toland Krieger. This is coming from an article from Deadline by Denise Petsky. Is set to direct the first two episodes of Green Lantern HBO Max series. So, Lee Tolan Krieger apparently he you know he did the first two episodes of Super Superman and Lois, he did River Riverdale, and he's done some other stuff. He to me he reminds me of Bill Cartwright. You bring him in, <laughs> let him do his thing in the beginning, and then sit him down. He ain't doing nothing else after that. He just gets you started. He gets the ball rolling. He gets the chemistry going. Right. <laughs> And you sit him down. So he's set to direct the first two episodes of Green Lantern HBO Max upcoming series based on the DC characters uh, from Berlanti Productions in association with Warner Brothers Television. So this was written by uh, Berlanti, Guggenheim, and Seth yeah. Graham Smith. Green yeah. Lantern reinvents the classic DC property. That word reinvent scares me. Uh, through a story spanning decades and galaxies, beginning on, it, which sounds interesting, beginning on Earth in 1941 with the very first Green Lantern. Secretly gay FBI agent Alan Scott in 1984 with cocky alpha male Guy Gardner, and, which is being portrayed by Finn Wittrock and half alien Bree Jarta. They'll be joined by a multitude of other lanterns from comic books, favorites to never seen before heroes. I'll stop there. I, I, I... Do you know how long this series is going to be? It's going to be like ten episodes, one hour. No, I don't. I don't even know. Do we know that? I don't know if we know. I could have sworn I heard something like that. Okay. They seem to be covering a lot, introducing a lot. It'll be interesting to see how long each episode will be and how many episodes we will get. Again, they're covering a lot. Uh, and if, you, you, if you've seen, you know Berlanti's work. That's the thing. And that's the thing that scares me. It's like, I don't want another, I don't want another a show or superhero to look like what he's done before with Flash, Arrow. I'm done with those shows. I haven't seen those shows in forever. Um, Titans is pretty good, but still has that signature Berlanti look and feel to it. Yeah. What are your thoughts uh, on what's going on with Green Lantern? Because it seems to be moving along. Yeah, look, the idea of a Green Lantern series that features the core as opposed to a single, single lantern, I think, is really interesting. But all of the fingerprints and footprints around this series would indicate it's just basically a CW series that's being aired on HBO Max. And that's concerning. I think Berlanti has a formula. It has been popular in the context of a CW. There's a reason why their entire lineup is basically DC adaptations at this point, because people watch. Yeah. But that's not the kind of viewership the HBO is looking for. Right, that's viewership levels that are good for the CW, HBO, yeah. HBO Max, Warner Media, Discovery. They are looking for viewership more along the lines of like what Mayor of Easttown was just able to do and become an, a phenomenon, becoming an event. Yeah, I this has the feel of like a missed opportunity. It's like we're firing a bullet with some great characters and a great idea, but we're kind of like our goal here is to kind of you know if we're an NBA team, we kind of want to go. We kind of want to win 43 games and be the seventh seed and knock out in the first round. Like that's kind of where we're at. Like we don't want to be, you know, a, a championship contender or a dynasty with four or five seasons. So I just haven't seen anything with this series to make me think like, okay, this is going to be appointment viewing. And if it's up against an MCU show and a star Wars show that you're going to put this as the first thing you watch. Yeah. I, I just haven't seen that yet. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. 
And yeah. putting this guy in charge of that as a director is like, okay, you're going back to someone you're used to, someone you're familiar with. So you're limiting your downside, but you might be capping your upside. Yeah, I mean, uh, those those are the same concerns that I have, man. I, I, but let's see. Hopefully, it doesn't look cheap because there, obviously there's gonna a lot of be, there's gonna be a lot of CGI in this. Um, I'm and just that hoping- we saw with a big budget with the Green Lantern movie was not easy. No, it that wasn't. Didn't look great. No, it wasn't. And and we've already seen a little bit of what a Green Lantern may look like with Zack Snyder's portrayal or version of it. We'll see, man. All we can say is we'll see. Because obviously um, they didn't want Zack to show a Green Lantern in his uh, Snyder cut. They want to keep this to themselves and they want to do something different. How different will it be? based on what you've already seen from other characters and story and stories that Bernanti has put out there. That's the question. Uh, let us know in the comment section below. Are you excited for the Green Lantern series? I, I would let, say that I am excited somewhat, and but more curious than excited to yeah, see the, what the this is going to be. Yeah. is cool. Yeah. yeah, the idea is, the premise is cool. That, that's, that's what gets you at least to watch the pilot. Another thing, Brian, though, I want to mention that we're going to be introduced to a lot of different uh, Green Lanterns. Are we going to get enough from these uh, Green Lanterns that we're going to care about them as much as we do from reading comic books and even watching animated series that we've watched with um, Jon Stewart, even Hal Jordan? And, And... what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if you do it right, you have to look at the template of like what Umbrella Academy and the boys have done, where they've kind of proven that there's enough room in one show for you to care about six, seven, eight different characters. And you can kind of link and feature them at, you know, I can highlight, I can highlight number five here, I can highlight number one here. And or I can highlight a train in this episode. You know, you can do things to bring them to the forefront, move them to the back, where a skillful showrunner and writer can get you invested in the crew, which I think is going to be the key here and the connectivity through time. But yeah, it's not easy. I mean, the, yeah. the, the more likely scenario is we might have one character who steals some scenes. Yeah. And yeah. then we might have a couple of characters who are kind of like, yeah, we could take it or leave it. Like anytime they're on screen, we kind of, you know, go to the bathroom or get a drink yeah. or something, you know. So yeah, so yeah that, that's what usually happens. But I think there are shows out there that have proven that the team can be sold to you in, in large numbers if it's done, if it's done well. Yeah, yeah. So let us know in the comments section below what you think of uh the Green Lantern series coming to you to HBO Max. Uh hopefully I think probably like next year they were supposed to release it. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be next year. Yeah. Next up, Mortal Kombat. Surprisingly, at least I was surprised when I heard this, exceeded expectations, says Warner Media executive. Mr. Brad Wilson has revealed that Mortal Kombat has exceeded expectations on HBO Max. Earlier this year, and this is this article is coming to us from Heroic Hollywood, um, written by Trey Griffith. Uh, earlier this year, the rebooted Mortal Kombat film debuted in theaters and, and on HBO Max. Critical reception of the film ha- was mixed. I don't know about mixed. And currently holds a 55% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Audience reception to the film, on the other hand, has been a different story as the movie has gone on to earn over 81 million worldwide on a $55 million budget. I mean, they made money, but not crazy money, not Joker money. Uh, but according to Warner Media, the film has been doing even better on the HBO Max streaming service. Listen, I can understand this being the case where if you're a person that grew up watching, or not watching, but playing Mortal Kombat, if you're a fan of Mortal Kombat, which was a very, very successful game back in the day, you would be curious to check this out and possibly see it all the way through and then seeing what else you got. So this is not surprising in that regard, but 
Had this yeah. been in 2019, this movie would have been a flop. What are your thoughts? Does this sound reasonable to you? Let Tell me what you think, Brian. Yeah, I'm with you on this. I'm not surprised people checked it out. It's still a brand and a franchise that's you know been reinvented as a game. It's still actually going pretty strong today in its latest iteration. So this is something that a lot of, there's a built-in fan base that cares about this. So you say Mortal Kombat movie with a real budget and people will show up for it. Yeah. I'm also not surprised, you know, I, it, it, again, we talk about event, event anything when it comes to the theatrical experience coming out of the pandemic and this is the kind of thing that is interesting right godzilla versus kong is essentially a fighting movie too it just involves monsters and here's a fighting movie that involves characters that a lot of people you know some know them very well some know them casually but uh and they're and they're also told hey this is the r-rated mortal Kombat you never got 20 years ago um which the other ones weren't yeah you get to see fatalities and get to see blood and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, on that on that standpoint, the movie checked those boxes. It just, you know, we talked about, it felt like it was just the premise was off the mark. The, you know, the, the lead character is off the mark. I think the question, what you're raising is if they come back and do this again, which it sounds like they're going to in 2023 and the world is normal and we go to theater full freight, is everyone dropping 20, 25 bucks to come back? For round two of this that i would want it like what was the exit grade that people gave this that watched it we don't have the cinema score afterwards and yeah. i'm not convinced you know like for me this would be a watch at home sequel not a go to the theater you put this on hbo max every two years you bring out a new hey watch it. yeah do a series really develop these characters we'll watch it but box office this is not a winner. Let us know in the comments section below what you think about uh, Mortal Kombat uh, exceeding expectations. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. It's probably jarring <laughs> when you first listen to that statement. But when you think about it, yeah, I can see that. Next up, this is coming from Deadline by, written by Mr. Mike Fleming Jr., uh, Jonathan Majors and talks to square off against Michael B. Jordan and boxing ring for Creed 3. Now, we know this is not super heavy talk, but still, this is a part of our childhood. And Rocky is everything. Or is it? Killmonger <laughs> versus Kang the Conqueror. What are you talking about? This is, this is what we're doing for Creed 3. <laughs> hey, listen. When they announced Jonathan Majors as, as uh, we, you already, you, you even told me like, hey, this is probably what I've been talking about for some time of bringing back the Lang family. Yeah, that's what I think it is. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Majors is a great actor. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I, there was someone else that I was hoping that they cast. He's a newcomer. Um, he was on the show uh, Power, Francis Johnson. Oh, okay. And the reason why I was like, this guy would be perfect is because if you saw Rocky Three, Mr. T was playing no games. He, yo, every scene that he was in, he stole the show. He stole that scene. Mr. T was the man. And this guy, Francis Johnson, he reminds me of his sort of character in the way that he speaks at his no-nonsense type of attitude. Now, I've seen Jonathan Majors in a couple of, 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 of shows, um, Lovecraft, Country, uh, Lovecraft Country. I don't know if you saw seen it. Yeah, that's an HBO show as well. Yeah. yeah amazing show and he's amazing he's other he's done other stuff as well and he's he's gotten nothing but uh praise for his uh performances and not to say that he can't bring that characterization but i guess i was just looking forward to getting that other guy because he looks so much like 
Mr. T in terms of his 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 facial expressions. He just reminded me of Mr. T and that type of dude. And I'm pretty sure Jonathan Majors is going to bring uh, a, a great performance uh, from that. Uh, what do you think uh, of this cast? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all TBD. We're speculating based upon the way the series has gone that he is, in fact, playing, you know, a relative of, of Clubber Lang. And obviously, if he is, then the the obvious hope and expectation would be Mr. T himself will be involved, perhaps in a way that Dolph Lundgren and, and Sly Stallone were involved in this series. And they've done, a, you know, the series done a great job of bringing those original generation characters in and making it feel believable and not making it feel campy. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, Mr. T was, such, um, Clever Lang was such an intense character. Uh, and so at times over the top, but always kind of fun. Like what is the old, you know, broken, maybe not broken. What does the older version of that character look like? That would be, would be an interesting question. I think the other thing to take from this is look, I mean, Jonathan Majors has arrived, right? I mean, you're frontlining a highly successful TV show. You are given a lead level Mar MCU villain role. And now you're in the Rocky franchise. Like you're set, like you are going to get balls, roles, scripts. So we're going to be seeing a yeah. lot of this guy oh, yeah. over the next five to 10 years. So the Jonathan Majors moment is definitely, definitely arrived. That's the other takeaway, I think. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to seeing his performance. And if he can give me that, again, if they don't, if he's not Lang, if he's not a Lang member, then I'm going to be upset. I barely watched Creed, what, two? I saw it in passing, you know, because I want to see Club of Lang. I want to see that that story because he was forgotten after Rocky Three. That was it for him. Whereas others, you've brought back, you brought back Dolph Lundgren in, in the last Creed. Mm -hmm. Apollo lives forever, obviously. Um, even Duke, the Duke, the trainer, has been in a bunch of films. And the most memorable guy in your franchise, Mr. T, has just been forgotten. I, I've always wondered about his uh, journey after that, the aftermath. What did he do with his life? That'll be an interesting story. HBO Max. There goes your show right there if, you, if, you, if you'd like to do it. Is it HBO Max? Yeah, HBO Max. They, yeah. they, they probably own the rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, that's a no-brainer right there. A series of Mr. T, we haven't seen this brother uh, uh, other than commercials. <laughs> I, I would love to see a series with Clubber Lang and, and all the, the, the dealings after the, the fight and what he has to say. I just want to hear what he has to say. Let us know in the comment section below what you think of Jonathan Major's cast as uh, possibly Lang or a different foe, which probably... Only his performance will make people care if he's not laying. Only his performance. Next up, why Taika Watiti promises new Thor craziness. This comes from us. This comes to us from Dark Horizons by Garth Franklin. Announced the other day, Disney and Marvel Studios wrapping a filming. They so, so we're done. We're, we're I guess we're getting the post production love and thunder has finally been confirmed by the star crims chris hemsworth that dude looks diesel he looks ready to be hulk hogan oh yeah you and you can for He's sure hulk hogan shape to put exactly this movie that's basically exactly, what happened. exactly i'm telling you i'm and you're hearing it first time in this show possibly in the first time in this show i don't know but chris hemsworth is gearing himself up for an academy award nomination for his portrayal of hulk hogan Terry Bollea, Hulkamania, NWO. We're going to see all that, hopefully. Uh, the Australian actor who has bulked up his muscles to a size much larger than he has ever had on film before took to social media yesterday to pose with director Taika Waititi and went and sent the Twitterverse ablaze with his swole arms and shoulders. Um, let me get to the, the thing that, that drives me uh, uh, crazy and has me a little bit concerned. Um, Taika Waititi, and I quote, this film is the craziest thing I've ever done, and I'm honored to bust my ass and have a nervous breakdown so you 
can all see it. This film is going to be batshit crazy, off the wall funny, and might also pull a heart string or two. You already know, Brian, that, I, and I think you can concur that we didn't really think Thor Ragnarok was all that. It was fun, but compared to some other films that we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this wasn't uh, something to go call your friends and say, yo, you got to watch this. We've spoken about this before. Brian, are you concerned that this is going to be Thor Ragnarok times 10? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in the MCU, Ragnarok is probably the move, the movie that's where you and I are farthest away from the consensus. Because I think the consensus is Thor Ragnarok is one of the best MCU films, and I wouldn't have it anywhere near my top five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you wouldn't either. So we're in the minority on this. And I said it when we went to production, and they brought Taika Waititi back. My number one concern was they were going to lean into the taika they were going to lean into the craziness and 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 amp that up and, and that does seem to be what they've done or at least that's what they're hyping that they've done now they have yeah. an amazing cast right they have an amazing cast for this movie but yeah i'm a little concerned that what we're gonna get is gonna be something that is again critically acclaimed maybe he pulls this all off and everyone's like wow this is original this is cool this is funny and we're sort of sitting there being like yeah but <laughs> it's just tonally not what we were hoping for um and you know i would say in Ragnarok, I think part of our disappointment also had to do with the Hulk is that they kind of used up the planet Hulk storyline. Which is a shame. Film. And so you now you're doing kind of the, the mighty Thor, which is a classic, you know, Jason Aaron story. And I think the concern would just be if you if it's too goofy and it's too off the wall. He were right you, there, ladies and gentlemen, goofy. You're taking, goofy. You're taking another really classic comic storyline and you kind of used it up maybe in you know a vein that isn't quite what we're hoping for so that, that's i think where our concern is coming from when we hear this yeah I, i'm concerned about the same thing too man uh, and listen the tiger what td is a is a very talented director and and he's a talented talent good actor um his directing skills are uh, 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 up there with the best of them. Um, but he's one of those guys that um, he does what he wants, right? Um, again, Thor Ragnarok for me wasn't the best or one of the best in the Marvel Cinematic Universe films that they've released. Um, and I'm just concerned that this is going to be too, and I'm going to bring that word out again, too, it's going to be too goofy. I'm going to use that word again later on. It's going to be too goofy. So let us see. Let us know in the comment section below what you think about. I mean, you're going to have fun. I assume you're going to have fun because he's. it's not like he's corny or anything like that. But do you want that for this movie and this character? No, it's also kind of like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy was fun and original and different. But I don't know that. Gar but I don't think anyone would tell you that Guardians of the Galaxy volume two really improved yeah. on one even yeah. though you could probably say that it leaned into the james gunness yeah. of the movie so that that kind of would be the analogy if this doesn't land but we'll see yeah next up black adam eyed to launch own franchise within dceu now this is going to be very interesting the dc this comes to us from screen rant uh written by rebecca vanneker the upcoming Black Adam movie starring Dwayne Johnson is being eyed to start the, start the character's own franchise within the DC Extended Universe. Currently set to release in 2022, Black Adam has had a long journey to, to the big screen. Johnson has been interested in playing the character since 2007. Keep that date in mind. 2007. 
What year are we in? Okay. But the movie didn't start building momentum until a decade later. Really? Okay. At the time, it was decided that Johnson's Black Adam would feature it in his own solo film. That sentence right there is very interesting. At that time, it was decided. I wonder what it means. Was it decided by Warner Brothers? <laughs> or was it decided by Debo? You know what I'm talking about. After being delayed due to the coronavirus pandemic, again, 2007, the pandemic didn't really hit to like 2020. That's when really things slowed down. So you're trying to do what happened between 2007, his interest. What's it, when did Iron Man come out? 2008. 2008. Then we get 10 years of awesome awesomeness by the MCU. There wasn't any interest there. Or what was the cause of him not making those films? Was it because of, I don't know, Rampage, maybe a skyscraper, truck driver? You tell me. <laughs> so after being delayed due to the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, Black Adam began filming in April, 2021. In addition to Johnson, the movie stars, yeah, 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 yeah. All these characters that I wonder, will we care about? They may have some awesome moments, but are we going to really care if, like, let's say, Hawkman dies? Doubt it. Doubt it. Uh, Brian, tell me what you think about this article and this franchise talk of the Black Adam. Because, yes, Black Adam and Shazam have a long history and it was decided that they do his, his Black Adam a solo film. <sighs> this screams The Rock doing what he wants to do. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, I mean, we've, we've had all these it's very it's very it's very rock speak right i mean rock is very good at promoting his his brand his you know his, the work that he does and and uh yeah no i wouldn't expect him to say anything less than he's you know or put out into the world whether it's through him or through his team that he wants to be in many many sequels you know involving this character but look we discussed it before it will come down to numbers he wants this to be a billion dollar film if it is there will be sequels. Yeah, 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 for sure. What his movie, what his solo standalone movies have typically done, there will not be sequels. It's really that simple. I mean, with again, with new management coming in, there's no allegiances to that 14 year gestation period around Black Adam. Right? Yeah. So this this project will happen because it's filming now. As we yeah. said, they will continue. It will get released. They will yeah. promote it. There'll be no issues with that. Yeah. But it will stand. I think on its own merit which means it will have to make serious bank yeah, for yeah. there to be black adam 2 black adam 3 no matter what the contracts say that's what will determine it and yeah. if it's like rampage and if it's like skyscraper and does 400 500 million dollars of global box office there's not going to be a sequel yeah know. the thing the thing that sort of like i don't know that makes me say like Yo, your movie hasn't even come out yet. You put out a graphic, like a motion graphic trailer. We, you, you tweet out some tweets of you wearing your costume, but you got like an overcoat over it or a robe. It's like these things are meant to excite us, for, or they think. These things are meant to excite us. It's not exciting me. I'm most certainly exciting Black Adam. I mean, Dwayne The Rock Johnson fans, possibly. But you have, you must be very, very confident 
in what's being shot for you to think that some franchise you're going to get a franchise out of this. It's a weird thing because I think I don't want to get on a whole rock discussion. No, no, no. I got you on this. The, the, The rock, when he was at the height of his powers in WWE, he was able to connect. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He did it both as a villain, like what he he was an amazing corporate champion what? before he was the people's champion. People Hells remember yeah. he was an awesome villain against Steve Austin. Oh yeah. And it was genuine, even though it was acting, I get it. But there was this genuine personality that came through both as a oh, bad yeah. guy and a good guy. Yeah, yeah. That for some reason he has almost chosen to bury as he's become more and more of a movie star. Mm-hmm. I find him to be less relatable the more successful he's gotten to where like now when he's Hobbs or whoever he is on screen, it just it feels a little forced. Yeah. Like it just feels like it's not quite real. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's being human or when he's being sort of emotional, that almost feels a little like contrived or over the top. Yeah. And it's a weird thing. It's almost like he hasn't quite figured out his on-screen persona the yeah. way he cracked the code of his in-ring persona. And Black Adam is one of those things where, quite honestly, if he channels his inner corporate champion, that's probably going to make for the most interesting Black Adam because Black Adam's not a good guy. Yeah. Not really. He's yeah. an anti-hero. So yeah. we need the bad guy rock, which we haven't yeah. seen in 20 years, to really show up in this movie. So I'm, yeah, that'll be, I think the challenge for him is to, to make that connection. Yeah. I agree with you, man. When the rock was the rock in the WWE, man, I couldn't wait to hit, to see him come out and talk and, right. and, 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 and performances that he gave, he was believable. You believe that guy. Um, can he pull it off again? That's the question with Black Adam. If it, if what I see when I go see it, because I will go see it. If what I see feels to me like The Rock being The Rock, I'll just wait till the movie's over and leave and say what I gotta say about it. And 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 it's not gonna be. I'm not gonna trash the thing, but if it's whack, it's whack. I'm gonna say it's whack. And if it's dope, I'm gonna say it's dope. But if it's just regular, it's like. Then, well, if you he know. tries to play it as Superman, the movie's going to fail. Oh, yeah. that It's as simple as that. If he wants to be the good guy, the hero hero, it won't work. He has to be more of like the Fast Five Hobbs and, like I said, more of his evil WWE persona. It has to be there for this character yeah. to work. Yeah, let us know what you guys think uh, with this franchise talk about Black Adam. movie hasn't even come out yet. We haven't really seen anything yet. Um... Let us know in the comment section below. Next up, Jupiter's Legacy. <laughs> Called this one. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> I had hopes that they probably would come out with something better. And yet, now they're coming out with possibly something even worse. Um... Coming from coming to you from Yahoo Entertainment, it seems uh, this article is coming from and written by Joe Otterson. Jupiter's Leg- Legacy Netflix series releases cast. <laughs> OK, releases cast a, a nice way of putting it uh, uh, as streamer orders. This title for this next series is like this is what who came up with this? Y'all sat around and thought this was dope. Super crooks? Really? That was what you came up with? Live action show. Uh, Super Super Crooks is set within the same world as Jupiter's Legacy and will follow supervillains just as Jupiter's Legacy followed superheroes with Netflix positioning the new show as the next installment in an anthology series. This is them seeing how can how can they recover from this failure uh there is also a super crooks anime series coming at netflix which is due to launch later this year with a first look at anis anis festival burn the 
you read this and you're like, I'm pretty sure you laughed. A, you laughed and you were saying to yourself, you were like this. Um, and you read the article and what did you think about the the release of the Jupiter, the Jupiter's Legacy cast and what they're uh, go, moving forward with. Well, I mean, Netflix has a notorious. We discussed it. Netflix has a notoriously quick hook. They, they, they cancel good shows. Yeah. Early. Yeah, so yeah. But when I got to the end of this show, I said, I mean, unless the audience is really there for this, there's no way no they're doing yeah. it. And sure enough, the audience wasn't there for this. Clearly. So. Yeah, no, no big surprise, no disappointment. They clear now. Netflix has a deal with Mark Millar that they're clearly in his business, right? So they're yeah, kind yeah. of basically going through his catalog, and I guess this was the next thing they settled on, as like, okay, Jupiter's, Jupiter's Legacy was a bust. What else do you got? Yeah, and this is what he had, and so they're going to make this. And like you said, it definitely is a course correction. Of yeah, we're sort of we're we're universe building just so to speak just ignore the smoldering pile <laughs> over there in the corner it is part of the universe it just won't be doing anything anytime soon so i'm with you like expectations low as always you know we see we see what they bring to the table in terms of trailer i think one thing that's being shown here is yeah it's we're in a show me mode, I think, with these, right? So, like, Netflix will fund it. They get one season approved. If the audience isn't there, it'll be gone just as quick. So, yeah. But I, I'm not optim I'm not that optimistic at this point. They need to rethink of how they want to do the, this, this show. So, hopefully, the tone is very different than what we got in Jupiter's Legacy. Because that yeah. just didn't work. And before we move on, I just want to make this quick comment. And I want to hear what you have to say about this. These are the type of things I think that make studios wary of because if super crooks fail, I mean, like somebody told you you watch super crooks, I'm like what super crooks? <laughs> <laughs> but these are the type of things that you're like, the studios may like, yo, listen, we, we, we can't do this anymore. You know, I we got like the old Fox, the old Fox night where they had cops, America's most wanted, <laughs> and then super crooks. <laughs> <laughs> but these, these, these are the type of things that you'll be like, okay, not that fatigue is setting in, but the willingness to go outside of, and because they have no choice, but the willingness to go outside to uh, uh, for doing these sort of uh, superhero slash villain type shows is getting a little bit old, especially when you have so much of it out there. I'm not saying this is fatigue, but less and less studios are gonna be willing to do these shows because they're not gonna possibly be good because the people behind them may not know what they're doing with these and they're just looking to cash in. Yeah, no, I think it's that the bar has been raised and I think you have more experimentation, which is good, but more experimentation means more failure. Yeah. And I think the tolerance for failure is going to be low with a lot of these cases. So I think, mm. and these shows by definition are hard to do on a low budget. No. Because you generally need superpowers and effects and you need things to look good or else you're no, pretty much yeah. defeated before you even begin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's one of those things. I, I, the other one that's been going around has been a lot of, a lot of space shows the last couple of years. A lot of space shows. Space is expensive. Hell space yeah. Space is hard. Like just by definition, if you do a space show, you are paying money. Yeah. And that's why you see a lot of those shows are one season and done, even if they're decent, just because yeah. the cost is so high. So oh, I think wait. superheroes fit that exactly. Great example. The Right Stuff uh, also was canceled after one season. <laughs> so I, I think with the superhero genre, it's the same boat. It is hard to make a five million budget superhero movie. It is, you know. So you're you're pretty much in for. I mean, Ant Man was what like 50, 60. Joker was fifty, sixty. That's kind of the low point. 
Yeah. So you think like for a TV show, eight to 10 episodes, what's the cheapest you could do it for? I mean, Falcon and Winter Soldier was 25 million an episode. That's probably high, but like, what do you think like 10 million episodes? You're probably in for 80 to 100 million for a season. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need that to work. You mean you need real viewership to justify that. Yeah, yeah. Away was a dope show, man. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I was looking forward to seeing more of that, but too much money. By the way, before we move on, did you see the set photos for Shazam? Yeah, they look pretty good. Suits they look different. pretty. The suit looks different. He. Uh, that's the thing about these 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 these, sh these movies and stuff is like, do we have to upgrade the suit every single time? I'm yeah. It's like, why can't they be who they are? Like Superman, it's like, do, would you change his suit? Christopher Reed did like four movies and he had the same suit. Christopher Reed had one, two, three was horrible, and four was horrible because of the people behind it. But it wasn't about the suit; it was about him being Superman and, 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 and him being Clark Kent. That was yeah. what was great about it. But uh, yeah, Shazam looks, it looks like Shazam. That'll be our show for today. There will be a part two to this show. Um, we got a couple of other things and who knows between now and then we might have a couple of other things to discuss because uh, there's something coming out almost every single day. Um, and we'll finish off our talks and we'll have a segment in our next show called oh really you don't say and i'll leave you guys to guess what i'm talking about but brian any last words no there's so much so much going on that we need to do part two so i'll look forward to doing part two and yeah we, we definitely have some some bigger big discussions we haven't even hit on yet so look yeah. forward to that so uh thank you once again and please hit that like and subscribe button hit that notification bell share it with your friends it really does help support the channel we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.